Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TFN Talks. My name is Shalina Begum, the Business Desk Northwest Editor and your chair for the next hour. Today's session is going to explore transport for the North decarbonisation strategy. As we all know, reducing carbon across the region's transport network is an essential part of tackling the climate crisis. And this strategy sets out ambitious targets for reducing surface transport carbon to near zero by 2045. This strategy is for the whole region and outlines not only the progress that can be made, but how the North can lead in slashing carbon emissions. Residents and businesses from across the region are being urged to have their say on the plan. The consultation opened early this month and will run until 31st of August. It is the first time a regional strategy of this type has been produced, bringing together the region's leaders to speak out with one voice on the climate emergency. It also highlights the ambitions of the North of England to go beyond national policy and meet targets much sooner. And that's five years earlier than the government's target of 2050. It also demonstrates the importance of maximizing clean growth opportunities, the need to ensure decarbonization is at the heart of transport related policy and investment decisions and why coordination at a regional level will provide the best outcomes. To explore further why and how the North plans to do this, we have a brilliant panel today. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about what you do. Can I start with Councillor Darren Hale? Thank you. Um, yes, so I'm the leader of the whole city council and obviously um, we're based on the Humber, which is the biggest producer of um, carbon in the country, actually, the Humber ports area. So we need to be, we are part of the problem, so we very much need to be joining our northern colleagues to be part of the solution. So what we've sought to do is position the Humber as a green energy estuary and obviously we've got a significant Siemens plant in the um, Hull area, which manufactures most of the um, offshore wind turbine blades for Hull, but obviously, and we would want to continue to position the economy here to be part of that, as I said, a solution and the decarbonisation agenda with regard to offshore wind and other renewables. And we're certainly looking at, say, um, um, a plant for um, electric, uh, for batteries for electric vehicles being co-located here. So we very much see ourselves as part of the, the solution for the whole North, but in order to be so, we have to have that connectivity with the rest of the rest of the um, great cities and areas of the north. So we're very much committed to the, 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 the TFN plan. But the, the key part for us would start with rail electrification, because um, perhaps not, um, not all your uh, viewers will be aware that we um, are not currently part of the uh, part of the electrified network, which only starts at Selby. And um, so our section needs electrifying to ensure that we have that greater connectivity so people can obviously get to Hull, but also our, our, um, we could be much part of a sort of a, a linked conurbation, which is so important for the North as, as a economic unit to rival the, the, the Southeast. What we've also been making um, in our pitch to government via TFN is that you don't just stop uh, at Hull Paragon station, which is our, um, you know, our passenger, uh, state railway station you actually ensure that that electrification goes further to the docks because you can't have a freight you can't have half a freight service you either have a freight service or not one at all for rail so what we were saying clearly there needs to be a con combined electrified rail linkage from from port to port from sort of Hull to Liverpool and across the the M62 so we're certainly keen pushing that um, I think the other thing that I would say was we, we also need to be part of the solution regarding um, other, vehicle, uh, other vehicular movements, because our section of the M62 is very light compared to the more congested parts of the region. So in a sense, there isn't a deterrent to use the, to, to use, um, you know, the motor car um, that there would be in other areas. So what we have to make sure is that there are, that, you know, that there, um, um, as I've said many times at TFN, in many ways, the electrification, the, the, the move to electric vehicles matters more about where the charging part points are in those other cities for residents of Hull 60 miles away than it does as much as where they are in Hull. So it's really important that we have a combined um, integrative model for how we look at um, how we're going to respond to that agenda, that decarbonising agenda and that electrification agenda. And so that, it, that can't be done as one city at a time unless your population never go anywhere. It has to be seen in a holistic way where we have that connectivity. Um, and we know, certainly just 
as a, just as I finish, as an as a, as a sort of byline, we certainly are um, sort of leading the way with our own council fleet in electrif electrified vehicles, and we've got uh, Peugeot's first electric vans in the country on trial in Hull. A number of them they're starting to come in now, and we're, we're moving to that. But there has to be a lot more uh, integrated authority action and government action, because whilst it would appear that. There is now channel shift or vehicular shift towards electric for smaller vans that's only up to three and a half tons and the big the big um challenge will come with that heavier plant and those heavier hgvs which is why if possible we need to shift as much as we can onto rail but we need a integrated northern approach to how we respond to making sure that the infrastructure is there to support the full electrification of all those other freight and public transport vehicles that um, we that we will need as an economy going forward, uh, Shalina. So perhaps I'll leave it there for now. Okay. Thanks, Karen. You've already raised um, some really interesting points and, you know, we need to move forward as one voice and one region to make sure that we get to where we need to. Um, can I next introduce um, Peter Cole, please? Thanks, Shalina. Um, yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here with this, this panel today. Uh, I suppose I should start by um, declaring my own interest in, in this topic. I'm an environmentalist uh, and, and previously to joining TFN uh, back last August, I worked in the environmental sector for about, uh, well, the better part of 20 years. Uh, and I think that's important as when TFN set its objective back in 2019 as part of our strategic transport plan to protect our natural and historic environments, as well as creating that decarbonisation pathway to 2050. One of the key actions falling out of that was to bring in some dedicated experience in-house. So I'm here, TFN have made good on that commitment and obviously I'm personally very glad that they did. Um, and I think that decision is, is reflected in my day to day where I've seen a genuinely impressive level of commitment to doing things better from a sustainability point of view throughout the organisation. And our decarbonisation strategy is in many ways our first opportunity to demonstrate this. Um, and it's been driven by two main aspects, which I, I draw out. Firstly, ambition. So our partners, like uh, Councillor Hill, uh, the local authorities and the LEPs that make up the North have really pushed us. So whilst remaining realistic in terms of the targets that you can assign at a regional level, we're putting our best foot forward and going beyond current national policy. Secondly, evidence. TFN has, has compiled a huge body of evidence to support our policy analysis and key to that has been the massively impressive analytical tools and capacity we have in-house and we've been really fortunate to be able to build up those resources and we're, we're really determined that the benefits falling out of their use are enjoyed by our local partners but also beyond and around the UK and we're liaising with the other subnational transport bodies in, in that respect. Now, I'd really urge uh, everyone listening today to have a look at that draft strategy that's out for co consultation. Um, but in lieu of that, some of my highlights, in, in my opinion anyway, of the strategy would be the uh, proposed regional decarbonisation trajectory that culminates in a close to zero date by 2045. The use of four future travel scenarios, uh, which helps us address that uncertainty of what the, the future might look like with different drivers of travel demand. The, the identification of the scale of the change required, and that's a cross mode shift, demand management and, and technological change to bridge our policy gap, and how that balance of those different things might change over the next 25 years. Uh, a detailed policy analysis to try and understand the sort of policy measures that would help deliver on that level of change, both in terms of national and local action. Um, commitments to measure and reduce the embodied carbon within TFN-led projects. Uh, the strategy looks at the potential opportunities falling out of clean growth and the agenda and the things that TFN can do to help deliver and optimize those opportunities, uh, as well as considering climate change and adaptation uh, and also understanding addressing the wider risks and benefits associated with transport decarbonization measures, including those related to tackling transport-related social exclusion. Thanks, Shalina. I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, so as, as Pete mentioned, the um, strategy is out for um, consultation and you can have your say up until the 31st of August. 
Um, can I go to um, Dr. Marilyn Comrie? Thank you and uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, decarbonisation is going to transform the way we live, work and travel. And I'm really passionate about ensuring that we begin to educate and involve ordinary people in influencing this strategy and bringing forward their great ideas. My personal mission is to create a, a, a kind of like citizens uh, innovation army uh, and, and getting some of the research and development that's being done in our universities into the hands of ordinary people so they can be begin to think about commercialising it. But also it, it really is about preparing them for the fact that the green businesses of tomorrow have probably not been created yet. And what a wonderful thing if the North became the Silicon Valley of the world, that actually we lead the world in, in low carbon innovation and adoption uh, and, uh, and that we can grow uh, scalable global businesses from here. So um, my background is I'm a serial entrepreneur. I uh, business development director of a trailblazing social enterprise called The Blair Project. And what we do is we're very much about developing the pipeline of talent that we will need in order to drive the electric revolution. And how we do that is by teaching young people how to convert used petrol go-karts into electric e-carts, which they get to test and race. And the truth is we're not going to be in a position to throw away all our diesel and petrol powered cars. We are going to need to develop new enterprises that enable people to uh, make that transition and, and do the conversion um, because sending it all to landfill shouldn't be uh, an option. And again, if we perfect it, this is a, a technology that we can sell into the rest of the world. I'm really passionate about a, a lot of strategies focus on infrastructure, they focus on buildings that we will need, but my focus is really about the people. And what you often see is that skills development, investing in people is usually an afterthought. But what we really do have to do is make that an in, a, a intrinsic part of the DNA of developing this strategy so that we're not having to look to recruit uh, a skilled workforce force from outside of the North, but actually we have a strategy in place to develop the, the people that we need in order to drive this and, and realise the decarbonisation aspiration that we have. Uh, in the Blair Project, we are, uh, in addition to the Blair Project, I'm also the new CEO of something called the Manchester Innovation Activities Hub in Greater Manchester, which will have a two-pronged approach. It will be a centre to support innovative SMEs to re-pivot themselves, to take advantage of decarbonisation and the low carbon green economy by providing them with industrial grade equipment and also workshop space. But in addition to that, we will be rapidly upskilling, reskilling uh, and training, retraining low income residents uh, in areas around the Moss Side, Rush Home, Fallowfield, so that they can take up these well paid opportunities within the innovation ecosystem. And the other thing that I'm proud to say is I also sit on the board of the Greater Manchester Local Enterprise Partnership and have the honour of being the first person of African heritage to sit on that board. And what I want to do is to use my um, visibility uh, and my participation in the innovation ecosystem to drive forward inclusion so that people, other people who look like me will begin to think, well, if Marilyn can do it, I can do it too. So that we end up um, making diversity in STEM and our innovation sector the norm, rather than at the moment, it is the exception. I go into too many rooms where I'm the only person of color in there. So that's really what my ambition is. And, and, and it is to get more people excited and passionate about this area in the way that I am. <laughs> Hans, <laughs> Hans, Dr. Marlin, um, some great points there. People, skills, training, all will play into the whole levelling up agenda as well. So definitely should be at the heart of it. Um, can I go to um, Professor Piers Foster? 
Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, uh, and the first thing I want to say is that it's fantastic to be here today among such an esteemed kind of panelists. Um, and, and I'll tell you about my job first. So, so, so kind of, kind of for my job, I am a university professor that spent a very long time researching the impacts of climate change on our communities. Uh, but I always have the other job where I do sit on the government climate change committee and, and this is the independent committee that comes up with recommended carbon reduction targets um, uh, and the exciting thing about the committee work is that the government has so far adopted all our all our targets into the national legislation so our committee has really kind of worked to get to to try and get these kind of the kind of net zero targets out out, out there with the government um but but the 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 very first the very first point I want to talk about is that the role of setting targets isn't necessarily deliver, delivering no targets. So, so we really have to transition from target setting to action and delivery. Uh, um, just like the kind of panelists were talking about. Uh, so, uh, uh, and this is quite this is quite timely at the government committee we in fact are about to to publish our progress report to parliament tomorrow so if you're interested you you can come and join that launch at 10 o'clock tomorrow this is like a kind of book plug of some kind but if you're interested please go to our community website to join that uh, 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 and that will i i really can't tell you what's going to be in that document but it is it, pretty obvious that we are going to be kind of picking the government up on this kind of on this kind of policy delivery aspect um and the second point I want to talk about that is a, that is really about communica communication. Um, the this is a transformational change we're considering, but but we really have to take our constituents and our population on board with us on this journey, uh, and the 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 government has done quite a pathetic a pathetic job in trying to communicate all of this big change so 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 i think this is where of coal for transport for the fourth in this consultation can kind of hopefully do a really effective job a really trying to trying to communicate kind of why we're going to change and kind of why it's necessary to change and and what are the things that go along with that change and and that brings me like nicely on to the third point in it very much picks up on what Marilyn was discussing about opportunities um so he talks superbly about the, op op the, op the opportunity for jobs and new training and skills within the community. But perhaps I can talk about the slightly bigger kind of, we, I think we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to really change the direction of 
human society and there's really is kind of kind of focused on this kind of country we do have the cop conference in no november kind of where we expect 200 well leaders to come to this country and it will be the biggest and most important kind of climate change conference that this country has hosted. We, we are leading the G7 currently. Uh, another thing is, of course, we have had the terrible pandemic, uh, and, but, but in a time of crisis is also a type of time of change. So we have a real opportunity now, I think, when all the ducks are time to really try and make this big change. Thank you, Professor Foster. That was really interesting. And um, you're right, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity change and um, direction, making sure that it is communicated to everybody it's going to um, impact. Um, for those watching, there is a um, chat box. Um, do um, put any questions to our panelists and I'll try and make sure we get them um, across as um, some already there. So we'll definitely put them to the panelists in a bit. So the first question, um, how important is it to have regional approaches to decarbonisation and how can we ensure they are delivered? And um, Councillor Hale, I know you sort of um, touched on that a bit earlier and it's quite a big, um, it's big on your agenda, isn't it? Um, it is, and I think it is, you know, the government needs to uh, get real with the, the, the potential, you know, the, the, the detail around the rollout of um, electrification strategy for, say, say charging points, because, you know, ours is a city, um, as are many in the north, with lots of terraced house infrastructure with no off-street off parking. So, the, the, you know, it's, gonna, it, it's a major issue already in lots of uh, urban areas with people drapesing electric charging wires across um, paths and streets. So we, we, we need a strategy and we need a strategy for the North. If, um, and also recognition that the North is not um, as wealthy as parts of the South. So I know that they've moved to perhaps having um, um, electric taxi ranks in Brighton. Well, the, 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 you know, the, the, the industry, the economic position of Brighton is very different to the economic positions of Hull or Bradford and parts of you know, Kirkley. So, so you'd have to look at that there would need to be some pump priming and a legislative uh, framework to support both organisations like TFN to have a north, a whole north approach, but also a national approach because um, there's two issues about channel shift to electric vehicles. And I saw one of the questions already, which was that people are only going to have the confidence when they know that they can get from A to B. If there isn't, and in some areas, it might have to be electric cars, not just a public transport solution. But, but equally, um, you know, there has to be a recognition of the affordability of, you know, in the cars on the roads of the city like mine, you know, the average age will be 10 to 12 years. So are you, are we saying that um, in parts of the North, there'll be like a two tree approach in the more prosperous areas, you might get there quicker, but that's not going to solve the um, decarbonizing agenda. There would have to be some sort of, a sort of legislative um, underpinning. And that can't just be with, a congestion charge where you say well you know we'll we'll ban vehicles because as i say in a, in a city like ours that would be a preposterous opposition given the average age of vehicles it's got to be a sort of unified approach across the north towards so that if i'm if i if i did decide to take the plunge um, and have an electric vehicle if i go to leeds i can get back because the current you know that's that would be the major issue but also one that recognises the government legislation, the government announcements, to that report to government today, which says that, you know, the answer isn't just to have all the cars we've got on the roads electric, because with, with, the, um, with, the, with the growth in um, car ownership, that will just lead to far more congest congested roads. And that from an economic output point of view, isn't the answer either. So we need to, in a sense, be making sure that we continue to bang the drum for public transport, make it more efficient, make it more effective, so that people have a real modal choice. And that includes walking and cycling. And we've gone down, as a very flat city, we've gone down the cycling route recently. And I'll be quite honest, it's, it's a hard sell to lots of your populace who see um, car, car owning as linked to economic prosperity and, and success. So we have to sort of re-narrate that, um, 
entire debate about, about modal transport and travel. But I think that can only be done. We can't have one, you know, a one city or a one town solution. It has to be done in an integrated way across an eco, a larger economic area like the North and the whole country. And government needs to be part of that um, narrative. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, um, I've often wondered about the whole affordability aspect. Not everybody can afford an electric car. And then when you do have one, where do you go and get it charged? So um, any of other panelists want to pick up on that first question before I move on to the next one? Uh, Pete. Pete. Hi there. I was raising my real hand, not my uh, virtual <laughs> one. So apologies for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess this is just um, backing up what Councillor Hill ha has said. But I think in terms of transport decarbonisation, I think you just need to look at how we live and how we travel. I mean, how many of us on this whole session uh, live in a different administrative boundary to where we work or drive to places in different jurisdictions where they want to go for a hike or a visit a family on the weekend or something like that? Where do all our deliveries come from? So travel is cross boundary by its nature. And we know that 70% of emissions uh, of our road emissions in the north uh, are from our major and strategic road networks. So a lot of those trips, a significant proportion of them are cross boundary. So we really do need a regional view on how emissions are generated and reduced too. And that consistency point is, is, is massively important. We need consistent approaches to the way we measure carbon, um, tar targets and, and, and make the targets and trajectories we're setting, but we also need a consistent approach um, between neighboring authorities in terms of policy measures and that's that's really important in in this in that sort of cross boundary context. And so, um, would you say, um, Peter, that um, you know how we travel as well has changed because of the pandemic? Yeah, I, I mean, it it definitely has. Uh, obviously, not changed for everyone. Um, and I think it's it's you know it's easy for me having been sat. I, I actually haven't been to work in the office in TFN since I started um, back in August. Um, but there are people who are still having to travel. There's some people who uh, can't work from home because of the nature of what they do. Um, and, and indeed, um, although we have seen uh, many people, perhaps particularly in the North, taking the option of, of, of the car instead of public transport, there are some people who don't have that option as well. Um, but in general, yeah, I think we have seen a, obviously a rise in, in home working and um, perhaps a uh, a reticence to take public transport and I think it's certainly um, that it is, is certainly elevated the mode shift challenge right up the scale to, to, to a point where it, it is perhaps our biggest challenge over the next few years is, is to how to increase that confidence back into public transport. Thank you, um, Dr. Marlin. Yeah, uh, I think that there is a lot of disruption that's going to take place in terms of I think going forward more people will be looking to work from home and having a kind of like blended approach and perhaps we can structure it so people travel in for two days a, a week to work in the office but three days from home that's a way of reducing the amount of traffic uh, on the roads. I think also people's relationship with cars are going to uh, to change so I've currently got three cars on my drive and uh, I try and walk and cycle everywhere and, and I can see that if we really perfect that then we're probably going to move towards a model of you hire a car if you really need to make a car journey because the reality is that most people make car journeys they're not traveling far distances they're perhaps going to the shops and we need to find uh, a, a better way of doing that. So actually it's about educating people to change their relationship with the car, change the, uh, the way that they do work. And the other thing that I'd, I'd like to throw into the mix, one of the things we're doing is developing technologies around houses as power stations. So the idea that you have a solar panel, it's connected with a hydrogen fuel cell uh, and an integrated electrolyzer that is that you can plug in and plug out and use it to power your car. So it just means that you're not going to have that need for expensive street infrastructure. Um, you can actually become self-sustaining and, uh, and, and power your car, power your home through using these new technologies. Thank you. That sounds very futuristic, but it's not unrealistic either, is it? <laughs> Um, 
Right. Um, got a question here. Um, how do we ensure that technology keeps pace with the urgency with which we need it to be developed, particularly for zero emission vehicles? And is there anything that needs to be done? Um, Don't know, Professor Foster, you want to take that? Um, okay. When uh, I probably didn't quite didn't quite catch the question, so perhaps you can repeat it. Just oh, sorry. Right. No, it's fine. Um, how do we ensure that technology is keeping up pace with the urgency with which we need it to be de developed? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, okay. So, so I I think the first thing to say is, is the is the it isn't really a technology limiting issue to deliver net zero. We certainly have a lot of the technologies already, like we have quite good batteries for cars. We have people trying to do solutions for HGV. Please, um, we have lots of different technology for trains, uh, 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 and I think we all know how to ride a kind of, kind of bicycle. But but I think there is a lot of technological innovation that we have to to do. To, and it particularly around the kind of kind of businesses. So so it particularly particularly around trying to get businesses to work out the way of trying to make these solutions pay uh, and trying to make these technology options as of portable and accessible as possible. And I think that's where our universities can certainly come in. Um, but but the, 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 the other thing, a more kind of subtle thing, like what are the right apps and kind of ticketing to try and encourage good kind of behaviors? Uh, and we talked about, we want, end-to-end -end solutions that take a person from place A to place B and perhaps their children and perhaps their bags of shopping. So, so, so we have to have really, really cool sort of ideas about trying to make this graded. So, so I sort of think it, it's, it's, it isn't just technology for brand new car or a new EV battery or brand HD, it's sort of this more integrated, more interesting, more kind of subtle sort of sort of thing is that I think that, that, that we can perhaps try and really exploit with all our entrepreneurs. That's Professor um, Dr. Marlin. Yeah, I, I just really uh, wanted to say that Personally, young people are so passionate about tackling the climate change emergency. And what I would like to see is that we get them, we mobilize them to come up with innovative solutions because young people have great ideas that older people like me might not have. And actually it's about harnessing that and saying, let, let's, instead of having to protest on streets, let's get them into innovation spaces. Let's get them dreaming up new ways of doing things because they will come with ideas that are left of field. And then let's surround them with the experts that can then take some of those ideas and turn them into reality. So for me, it's about let's get more people involved in coming up with those innovations is really what I, and that way we'll accelerate towards the future much faster. And then is the challenge then engaging those young people? Yeah, and, and for me, we've never had any problems engaging young people. Young people love this kind of... But this is a generation who were brought up on the milk of technology. They get smart technologies, their brains work in that way. So that's really what I'm saying. Let's harness the natural skills and talents they have, but their passion for accelerating the climate change agenda and put it to good use in much the same way that motorsport use 
people in sheds are garagistas. And that's why the UK now leads motorsport because of not the, Re not the Renaults or the Mercedes or the uh, Ferraris, but the people in sheds. So let's go back to that people in sheds, having fun, testing and piloting things and innovating. Uh, Dr. Marilyn, um, Councillor Hale. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a real danger that, uh, uh, that we're not ready and that in a sense, if we're not careful, that, that that comes to two solutions, which is that we push back on those on those commitments, which would be a terrible thing to do. Or worse still, we come up with other models that are we, 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 we see few, a future technology advancement as the solution, but that won't come in time, whether that's hydrogen or, or, or whatever. And I think we are going to have to sort of have that combined commitment to keep a sort of uh, foot to the floor, if we like, on the foot on the front of government to say, look, we have to come up with those combined solutions. I mean, um, I, um, I talked to our fleet mechanic, our, our head of our fleet, who's a real good um, te technological green anorak. But what he'll say to you was that, so for example, the hybrid electric model, um, he says 90 to 95% of hybrid model cars are never charged up. They, 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 you know, it's just a myth. They all run on most of the time on diesel fuel and part of that is the way that companies remunerate their staff so they'll give them a fuel card but if they have to charge up at home they're using their own electricity so all that so the, the, the structural issues in the economy stop that 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 sort of uh, change to to doing the right thing so i think what we have to do is we have to say no to government we can say to government no you have to come up with a solution where you in a sense encourage and facilitate and even legislate to Force that that there is this sort of charging infrastructure across the north, and that we also, at the same time, do develop those alternative technologies. And don't it's not one or the other; it's complementary to ensure that we we move forward. But that it is also about. I mean, I'll finish on this thing that Liverpool's got a pilot, isn't it? One of the pilots nationally on those electric scooters. Well, bizarrely, that might be a form of mass tra transport. Certainly, for lots of young people get into A to B. You know, it might be an alternative to where public transport doesn't run. We might have to look at those sort of more radical solutions to encourage more exciting and different ways of travelling from A to B rather than just relying on the public motor car or just traditional public transport. So I think we have to not rule anything out or anything in, but not let not let um, us slip the targets, which would be my bigger worry, I think. Mm -hmm. That sounds, um, um, Peter, I think you've had your hands up, yeah. Sorry, Peter, you're mute. Sorry, yeah, hands and again. Um, yeah, so um, very quickly, yeah, I mean, I think the, the uh, just just quickly on that, that scooter point, and I've noticed a comment in the chat, and all the comments have been great, so it's quite hard to keep up with them, but, um, but uh, yeah, things like e-scooters and e-bikes, um, they could really be viable prospects for, for the topography that we have in the north. And we have to understand as well that, um, you know, whilst an e-scooter might not suit uh, me particularly, um, we, we have to help everybody decarbonize. And many people don't want, want to get on a bike and actually an e-scooter does suit them better. Um, and we, we need to play to that. Um, what, what I would say about the technology point is that, you know, I, I agree with what everyone said. I think it will keep pace. I think where there's private enterprise and ultimately profit, um, we will see technology keep up. But I think as policymakers, we need, we need to do a few things. And, and one is avoid market failures. So we can't have another rural broadband situation. We've got to make sure um, that we're catering for everybody. Uh, we've got to ensure that uh, the divergence of technologies doesn't, doesn't hamper our efforts. And I think overall, we need to keep a really tight eye on the decarbonization outcomes of all these technologies. Uh, not just the financial ones. Uh, there's always a danger there too. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm going to just take a question from the um, audience here. And um, one of the first ones was, um, what is TFN's formal position on the Leeds Bradford Airport planning application, such as terminal building and the proposed parkway station? So, um, Peter. Sure. Um, I I, I can't give a, a formal opinion on that because I, on behalf of Tina, I, I, I don't know is the answer. Um, so it's perhaps something we can uh, we can come back to if, um, if that's all right. No worries. Um, uh, talking a lot about, you know, some really great ambitions and really great ideas. 
But to do that, we need the skills. <laughs> and, you know, do we have the skills at the moment? And do we have the skills for those future, um, you know, enterprises, you know, and where's that skill coming from? Dr. Mar, do you want to take that and then? So. Yeah, so um, it, it is about uh, employers investing now in developing that skilled workforce that we need. The high value manufacturing catapult have been developing a project called the Emerging Skills Project, which is about looking two years hence at the, the kind of skill sets that we are going to need to drive the decarbonation uh, decarbonisation agenda. So it includes, you know, um, uh, electric, uh, uh, it includes batteries and electric management systems so that you're upskilling the existing workforce, but also uh, reskilling new people that are going into uh, the sector. But at the moment, industry has been very reluctant to make that investment. They've been relying on colleges. And now I think that or other institutions and then complaining that young people are leaving or people are leaving without the skills that they need uh, in the real world. So I think it's about saying to employers, we know this is coming. You have to plan and prepare for it. Otherwise, it'll be like a, a slow car crash. Uh, and we'll be hearing the same uh, call that we can't find the people with the skills. Well, you need to be part of the solution for developing that skilled workforce now because we've got plenty of time to do that yeah um perhaps perhaps i can come in and comment on this i mean the, the i do kind of work at one of the biggest universities in the country is not quite big as manchester's but it's still pretty much up there but but um uh, and I, and I do still find it quite kind of frustrating that my institution is sort of churning out still, you know, 10,000 10, quite traditional kind of graduates annually. Uh, 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 and, and I think there are, there, are, there are real opportunities for that education and that development of skills to become more in, trained in the way that we work and to try and get people at all points in their career to really change uh, and to really begin to do things a bit differently. So I think we need more interdisciplinary for working where, where kind of people aren't just an engineer, part of their engineer, but they do, under, do understand some of the social science aspects of trying to make a change. So, so I think we sort of com combine disciplines are really kind of what we have to work towards. Thank you, Professor. Um, I was going to ask, oh, sorry, Councillor Hale, you're going to join. It is quickly, I think it's it, 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 it sort of working on the micro and the macro level, isn't it? I think, you know, in a sense, for example, say Stevens in Hull have said, we will, you know, we will look to double our um, blade plant. That's what they've got a live playing application in. But what they want is that commitment from government that government will commit to buying that, that fuel mix of electricity, you know, from, from offshore wind. And then in a sense, they will make that investment. And it, it all sort of hangs together because once there is that investment and once there is that infrastructure, people, you know, if I'm making, if I'm a youngster wanting to make a career choice or a firm wanting to train people, you won't train for a job that you're not sure where there's no surety. So it's about de-risking that environment and saying, no, we, we are in for the long haul, we're committing to this. And then I think you will build that infrastructure and people will come and, and, and young people will, will want, want to see that as an industry with a future to move into. And um, that's certainly our experience, but it's about that commitment from, you know, that commitment that we are in for the long haul. And the, the, this is something that, in a sense, has a future. And, and then, in a sense, we can build that confidence around that. Because I think, I think that um, where you don't do that, and I give you a classic example, traditional mechanics, because of the, it's a sort of perceived as potentially a dying industry with the EV coming on, it's very difficult to get people traditional mechanics at the moment for, for, for traditional 
you know, petrol driven motor cars because they're, we're in that hiatus between one technology fading out, albeit over a length of time, and one coming in. So, in a sense, with, with, with those newer technologies and that green energy, et cetera, we do need that commitment and that long term commitment from government to match the ambition of local authorities and, and, and the regions and big companies. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I think, um, you know, Councillor, you've touched on this before about, you know, other funds are few. Hydrogen's going to play a big part as well, you know, in decarbonising in, in, in industries. And, you know, what, what's, how important is that in terms of transport? And how do you think that's going to be used going forward? So, uh, Sorry, was that of me shooting or someone else? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, if, if you want to take that, and I think uh, Professor Foster also wants to come no, in on this point. I, I think that it's not either or, is it? And I think it's not uh, putting all our eggs in one basket. I think certainly I see there's the real growth potential, certainly in our, um, around our East Hull docks. And, and we know that there's lots of organisations that are investing heavily in, uh, in potential for hydrogen as being the, the solution. But I think it is also about making sure that, as I say, we don't, you know, um, we don't choose the Betamax video option, isn't it, really? We have to make sure that we, we keep all, all available options because there won't be one, tenor, one, technolog one technological solution to this. I think it will be um, a, a range of potential solutions. But ultimately, when we're talking about tra uh, that transport as well, I think we have to also remember it is about um, modal shift. I, I genuinely think if you look at, say, the Dutch, the Dutch, say, own more cars, I think, than per capita than the UK, but they use them a lot less. So it's about getting the balance right in how we use those technologies as well, I think. Thank you. Um, Professor Foster, are you going to come in on that point as well? Yeah, I, I just want to say, I do think we have particular opportunities in this part of the world. I mean, we have the, 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 the government have put a lot of money into hydrogen in the T's of Valley project. So I think we have an obligation to really make that work. Uh, uh, and I think if that works for right, you can see some things, I, I think we can really showcase to the rest of the country and even to other countries, uh, try, really trying to showcase new te te technologies. But I think I ought to say that we don't we don't really want to be substituting kind of hydrogen too much for for electrification. It's not a very efficient way to generate energy. So, 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 kind of so as much as possible, I. I think we ought to be trying to electrify things. Thank you. Um, Dr. Marilyn? So you just unmute. I just wanted to raise awareness that in Greater Manchester, we've created uh, the first low carbon hydrogen hub uh, with a, a number of partners. It's a partnership with the Manchester Fuel Cell. Innovation Centre at Manchester Metropolitan University and uh, Carlton Power, as well as Electricity Northwest and uh, Cadent Gas. Uh, and in addition to that, we've also, there's a project called HiNet, um, and that is about, uh, they're building a, a pipeline. Uh, they're going to start producing hydrogen in D side, which is just the side of uh, Chester and uh, piping it into Merseyside and Greater Manchester. So hydrogen is going to form a really important part of the economy in the Northwest, but it is about sharing that knowledge and expertise. So it's a particular strength of, um, it's a particular R&D strength within the Northwest that we're aiming to build on, but actually share um, the knowledge and know-how and hopefully increase the efficiency so it can actually become uh, a viable alternative to electrification. Thank you. Um, one of the questions we had uh, submitted earlier um, asking um, 
if we can learn lessons from other countries in becoming you know, carbon neutral. And it referenced Indian Railways, which is planning to become net zero by 2030 and is doing a lot of work on electrifying its network at the moment. So, I mean, are there examples of other countries that we can use? Are we learning from our um, counterparts elsewhere? Um, Peter? Yeah, I mean, it, yes is the, the, I guess the short answer to that. I, I think we need to be really careful not to discount solutions from abroad. Um, Dr. Comrie was saying earlier about, you know, how we, we, we need views from people we haven't normally taken them from, but that includes looking abroad. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we shouldn't discount them on the basis of being too radical or not likely to appeal to our British ways or something like that. And I think, you know, we've, we've, we've seen the step changes in behaviour that be, can be achieved through the COVID pandemic. Uh, and, and so, you know, knowing that um, we're going to need ras radical solutions to hit our ambitions, I think we should be looking to some of these examples. So, I mean, what, what so, I mean, some of perhaps the more well-known ones would be the... Um, EV uptake in Norway, which has been stimulated for a, a variety of measures, but you know um, that's been immensely successful. Um, the increase in, in cycling in places like Denmark and Holland, uh, we might think of, of, of Holland as being a cycling nation, but it hasn't always been actually. Um, and, and the sort of um, cycling as well that you find in those sort of places that actually isn't just for those local journeys, but you're starting to see sort of almost town to town journeys via cycling, where those towns are, are nearer together. Um, and, and also pointing to things like the hydrogen ambitions in Japan, um, where, you know, they've, they've made a sort of decision to sort of push on and, and they're going all guns towards it. Um, so they're all great examples of where measures are all already working. And I think we can draw inspiration from. Um, I think the Indian Railways one is, is interesting. Uh, as far as I, I know, it's predominantly around electrification and, and some solar at, at stations. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to understand how their sort of energy generation decarbonisation parallels with it. So, in fact, how, how decarbonise that electrification will actually get them, uh, how, how long, long the decarbonisation pathway. But... I mean, generally, we have to do the same thing. We, we have to electrify as well, and we have to have a mass, do that on a mass scale. And, and for those areas where it doesn't make sense to electrify, we need to find alternative solutions, absolutely. Um, but we also have to recognise that, you know, we're not, we, we, we have different planning constraints and different cost constraints as well. Um, and so all, all of these different solutions are gonna, going to be uh, happening at different timescales in different places. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pete. Um, I was going to sort of point out, um, Greater Manchester has recently approved in its, its clean air zone. And you know, how important are initiatives like that, again, you know, playing into this decarbonisation agenda? Should we doing, be doing more of that across the UK? Um, Professor Foster? Yeah, sure. Perhaps I can come in. Yeah, I think that sort of thing is absolutely vital because it not only considers the kind of climate change aspect, it also talks about the opportunities for air quality and... ...health, and it's all about, kind of, kind of, it's all about trying to get more people on board with the changes. And for example, Darlin talked about trying to engage the communities and I think that is where a lot of the kind of black communities are there there within our inner city in farmers that have very bad air quality so, so I, I think there's a real opportunity there's a, there's a there's a real opportunity to go and go and go and go and talk to the urban communities uh, about what are the benefits of this transition and this and this kind of change for themselves and for their kind of livelihoods. Thank you. It's certainly like um, yeah, you're right about um, changing behaviours and communicating that to um, people that's um, involved. We talked a lot about, you know, trains and um, cars, um, 
What about you know freight and you know logistics and aviation as well? Because that's going to play a big part in in this. Um, Castle Hale. Yeah, I just wanted to say one of the problems with the with the policies around say air quality in say city centres. So like in our city, we have the docks to the east and the roads out to the rest of the north to the west, and you'd have to go you have to go through the city to get from A to B. The problem we could have there was if we just said, oh, well, it's all about air quality, we would effectively why people would just go to the next docks along where the, perhaps the docks are not having to take you through a city centre. So we have to be realistic about that it isn't one size fits all, because whilst I, as a ward councillor for the city centre, I would love that. But on another level, I also have to recognise that people need jobs. So the, the, the alternative is that we need to make sure that the, uh, we, we have safer and more efficient uh you know fr freight movements which ideally would be as i say if you put um rail freight to the docks for us as a, so people at least have an alternative which they currently don't have but secondly how we then look to decarbonize um hgvs and freight because the reality is we talk a lot about other um other forms of transport we're not that's not going to happen overnight and we need to look at um how we do that and also in terms of container ships and, and those ships transporting across the oceans and which are often forgotten in terms of this entire decarbonizing agenda because what we're not going to do is stop the need for trade and the need for movement of goods goods and services what we need to look at is how quickly we can um, make that step change and as i say one of the problems you have is that um the technology is often at the lower end and not at the top end so um you can get on a good deal a transit van a few thousand pounds more uh cheap slightly more electric but when you come to say a dust car or an hgv lorry you're talking about five to ten times the cost currently so in a sense we have to look at um technological improvements in those areas otherwise we're we're not going to be, be to move that agenda forward and to me that is about obviously where you have a choice giving people a choice but we also have to look at um making those other forms of um HGV cleaner and more efficient for city populations because it's often you know it's often the poorest residents that live in those inner city areas that those polluting vehicles are traveling through. Thank you and let's not forget uh, residents living in um, some of our rural areas as well because this doesn't just impact city centres it's the agricultural sector that's going to be affected by this as well going forward. Um, we are um, approaching um, two o'clock now, so we don't have much time, but um, can I just quickly go round the panel and ask for any sort of last thoughts on this? Um, Peter, shall we start with you? Yeah, I think this reflects a lot of uh, the panel's comments today, but uh, I want to quote Albert Einstein, as many people do, when he said that we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we really need a wide spectrum of engagement on all this and some out of the box ideas. And, and that's a plug really. Uh, the decarbonization strategy is out for public consultation right now. It's running for 12 weeks. So don't miss out on, on actually having a say in helping us solve some of these problems with some, some different thinking. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Professor Foster? Yeah, I would completely endorse what Peter said about trying to put your points into the decarbonisation plan for TFN. And I think we had a lot of interest in the chat. So there's the, there's all this great wealth of ideas to everyone and throughout our communities. Uh, uh, and I just think we do have to collect, the, we have to get those ideas because they're, those ideas are the one that will work very, very best for our community for our communities, but, but we then have to have somewhere and someone like TFN, for example, to be able to provide the connections to try and make sure they are co make sure they are coordinated and really work. So I think that's where we have to play that important job. Uh, and I would really go back to what I said to I, I, I think we have a real once in a once in a lifetime time to really make a change because it's on the top of everyone's agenda. So I just think we do we do we do all owe it to to go back to our communities and really evangelize about really what we're trying to do. 
Thank you, um, Dr. Marilyn. Yes, uh, just building on that, I, I think that what we need to uh, be communicating to people and communication, I absolutely agree with uh, Professor Piers, is, is the key uh, and also what Peter said. So, uh, and, and part of the communication is not just about, you know, the way that we work, live and travel is going to change, but also about the business uh, opportunities that are coming and that the new, not just the new green jobs, but the new green enterprises. So how can we begin to help and support our entrepreneurs, our businesses to either re-pivot. I, I think they will need help with identifying where are the supply chain gaps, again, that they can fill rather than saying, well, we, we, we don't have the supply chain. So much more to be done in terms of identifying where those gaps are, both in terms of skills, business opportunities. And lastly, uh, my call is really just for employers to become much more proactive in preparing for this, uh, this future by beginning to think about what are the skills they're going to need for the future and being more actively involved in training up that workforce that we need. Thank you. And um, Councillor Hale. Yeah, I think it's continually to, to, to recognise the decarbonising agenda has to be linked to climate change. And certainly, you know, cities like ours that flooded in 2007 and 13, absolutely imperative that we remind people of why we're doing this. But equally, not always to see it as following on from what Marilyn just said, it's not always seeing it just as a threat, but seeing it as the opportunity that it poses to, to be a, a new, you know, a new economic um, way of us restructuring and help, helping re-energise the North. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you to all our panellists for um, their insights today. I'm sure it's been um, really interesting. I've certainly found it um, interesting. And um, as Dr. Foster said earlier, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to change direction. And I think, as all panellists will agree, it's about everybody being involved, it's not just one section of the um, communities. Um, so, for more information about the decarbonising strategy and to have your say, please do go on to transportforthenorth.com decarbonisation. It's all on the website and you have until the 31st of August to um, have your say. Thanks again for listening and thank you to our panellists.